Our shepherd for tonight is Bishop Pablo Virgilio David, fondly called by his flock as Bishop Ambo. As the Bishop of Diocese of Caloacan, he leads more than a million souls in Avotas, Malabon, and some portion of Southern Caloacan. As the head of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines, he also leads the Filipino Church in its mission for evangelization in this part of the world. Hello, Bishop Ambo. Welcome to Heart Talk. We are so delighted to have you here with us. How are you? I'm doing very fine. Thank you, Burns. And uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you for having me in this interview. Would you remember the first time you heard the voice of God calling you into this ministry? So could you tell us a little bit about your childhood, your family yeah. background? My vocation story started very early. Right. Yeah, because I, I went to school very early and it was in my catechism class that I was, you know, awakened to mm -hmm. the meaning of the Eucharist. It was our, you know, town, our parish catechist, mm -hmm. uh, and I was four years old, you know, uh, who um, really uh, stirred up my imagination. Uh -huh. He said, if you want to know whether or not uh, Jesus is present, present. you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the church, you have to check if the vigil lamp is burning. And I said, oh, what's the connection? If uh -huh. the vigil, I, I knew about the vigil lamp you right. know, because you know the, the family went mm -hmm. to church regularly, mm -hmm. and uh, I always noted that there was a hanging vigil lamp there that it was always you know burning. Right. And the vigil lamps were never electric; they were you know real oil and, lamps. Yes, yes, yes. Time. So I said, "What's the connection?" I said, "If it's burning, it means um, the Lord is present, uh -huh. you know, in the tabernacle." And, and said, in the form of the Eucharist, in the consecrated host. I said, oh, wow. So what I did was, every day, and you know, I, I entered grade one at four years old. Okay. <laughs> Imagine that. Grade school. Very <laughs> early. School. Yes. Very early. <laughs> yeah, I graduated uh, in grade school at uh, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. And from home to school, mm -hmm. uh, I would uh, drop by the church and then check if the vigil lamp was burning. Uh -huh. And if the vigil lamp was burning, you know, I, I, I would say to myself, oh, Jesus is here. <laughs> yeah. And then I didn't even know what to say to Jesus. I said, hello, I'm here. <laughs> That's all. And then on my way back from school to church, I would drop by again at twice a day okay. just to check if Jesus is present, you know. And that sort of made me develop a very personal relationship with Jesus. You know, one day, uh, I went to church and the tabernacle was open mm -hmm. and, and the vigil lamp was off. Okay. It wasn't burning. Right. And I panicked. And I ran to my mother and said, Mama, what's the matter? Jesus is <laughs> not in the church. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? What are you talking about? He said, the tabernacle was open and, and, and the vigil lamp was not burning. And according to our catechist, if it's not burning, then Jesus is not there. And I said, oh, you didn't hear about it. You know, our parish priest got sick. Mm. So he had to be pulled out and okay. he was given a sick leave. And so we hold no mass in the parish. Okay, I see. And, said, and, and when there is no mass, there is no Jesus. <laughs> and then I connected the mass with so, Jesus. Yes. So if, if there is no priest who can celebrate the mass, there will be no Christ in the tabernacle. And so I asked my mom, do you think I can become a priest, ma? Wow. And my mother, many years later, would remind me of that, that question. And my mother said, 
well, we'll pray about it. Uh-huh. We'll pray for it. You know, I would love that if you really are called. You know, and how did I know that? That was really the beginning of my calling already. So the period of discernment started when you were younger. Yeah. It continued up until high school. When do you remember the moment? Well, that was yeah. after graduation in grade school. All right. Yeah. Okay. And it was after I graduated in grade school that a seminarian came to uh, the elementary school and started talking about the seminary. Mm-hmm. And then when I went home, I reminded my mother. I said. Ma, you promised that you would allow me to enter the seminary. I said, but you're only graduate. You've only graduated from grade six. Right. I said, yeah, but they said I could enter minor seminary. Okay. And my mother hesitated. He said, aren't you too young for seminary? And I said, no, no. I think I think that would be nice if I can study already in the seminary. And she allowed me. And so there, I entered minor seminary. Mm-hmm. It was actually a regular high school, you right, know? right? And we had a lot of time to be a, to, to to be with family mm-hmm. also. So usually, you know, the weekends were with family, and the weekdays were in the seminary. Right. So, yeah, four years of minor seminary, and then I uh, applied at San Jose Seminary mm-hmm. with the Jesuits of the Ateneo de Manila. I see. And that's where I did my philosophy, my uh, college uh, seminary formation years. For another four years, I graduated philosophy at the Ateneo and then went into theology. Theology. Yeah. And then five years of theology still at San Jose Seminary, still under the Jesuits. And then I got ordained at a young age of 24. 24. Imagine that. Yes, I can imagine. That was still part of the old canon law because Uh now in the new canon law, the minimum age is 25. 25. And you would need a dispensation, you know, if uh, you are underage. But yeah, at that time, 24 was quite okay. (laughs) Bishop, discernment and doubt would always go together, especially when you have a vocation. Could you tell us a little bit more about the spiritual direction that you received back in the seminary? Well, the most serious spiritual direction I got already from the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because the Jesuits always put together prayer and discernment. Right. It's like, as you grow in prayer, you grow also in the gift of discernment. Mm -hmm. And, And actually, they encouraged us to pray for the gift of discernment. You know, listening to the movements of the spirit, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that was new to me. And um, I had, you know, very good spiritual directors who were excellent listeners. Right. Yeah. And, and I, I do believe that uh, spiritual direction really, to a great extent, is accompaniment, you know. Mm-hmm. And I felt that my spiritual directors accompanied me spiritually. They said, they would rather be called co-discerners than spiritual directors. Yes, that's a beautiful They thing. said, uh, we're not here to direct you. Yes. Your only director is really the Holy Spirit. Right. So we're here to accompany you and to teach you how to sensitize yourself to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I picked it up very well from the Jesuits. When you were ordained, did you even imagine you will be one of the bishops, the successor <laughs> okay. of the apostles? Yeah, being bishop is a ministry. Mm-hmm. So, no, never imagined, even in my dreams. Right, uh, right. I was happy enough as a professor of uh, scriptures. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, I was ready to dedicate my whole life as a teacher in the seminary. Mm. Yeah, I was specially trained for biblical studies, and then I was assigned in the seminary. Uh, I was assigned in the parish also for a little while, but oh my goodness, 17 years of my early ministry as a priest were spent as a professor. Mm-hmm. So I was a teacher in schools of theology. I was uh, teaching in the in the seminary, right. and I found it very meaningful to be accompanying young men mm-hmm. uh, who were also searching and trying to discern their vocation. But uh, contributing to their intellectual uh, formation was very enriching also for me. You keep on mentioning about listening, accompaniment. These are the stuff that we talk about in the synodality of the church that our Pope wants us to do. How is it now? How is it like accompanying more than a million souls in the Diocese of Caloocan? What are the challenges? The challenges have always to do with the three aspects of synodality. Okay. Communion, participation, and mission. Right. We cannot be community without communion. Um, community becomes collectivity without communion. Right. You know, very much the same as family, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, just putting 
people together under one roof doesn't make them a family, family yeah. if there is no relationship that is being built. Mm -hmm. Now, within the church, we're family, mm -hmm. but a, a family that is not bonded by blood relationship, right. but by spiritual relationship. Mm -hmm. And it's the spirit who brings us together mm -hmm. uh, so that where two or three are gathered in the name of Jesus, there is there Christ there is. Because yes. then the body of Christ becomes present in the community of disciples. Amen. And that is the first challenge, how to build that communion that will pave the way to community. In, in our diocese, the priority is really community building. Yeah. And it's the reason why I have been building not new parishes, but mission stations. Mm -hmm. I, I call them the church's presence among the poorest mm -hmm. of the poor. I have partnered with religious congregations and missionary congregations, uh, you know, and deployed them to slum communities right. and to live with them, to live with them. And, you know, I call it the church without the church, mm -hmm. you know. And it's really, uh, their, their main task is really to build community, to build a Christian community. Right. And uh, it's not easy. Nowadays, we call it basic ecclesial community. You know? There is greater intimacy among, among the members, you know, where people can break the bread of the Word of God, you know, mm -hmm. and, and really be constantly nourished by the Word and then become a community. And there are so many um, obstacles to community building. Mm -hmm. People are very busy. Yes. Poverty is a huge factor, you know. Sometimes people are on survival mode, mm -hmm. you know. So to be to be able to uh, for pe for people to be able to find time mm -hmm. even to to join a BEC right. uh, or to to join a, a faith sharing group or a lecture divina, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's already a big challenge in itself. Sometimes they have very basic needs, you know, right. Right. and how to address those those basic needs is also a big challenge. You know? The second challenge to synodality is participation. Participation. And, you know, it, it pains me to admit that one of the obstacles to participation is clericalism in the mm. church. You know? And I, I keep telling our priests that uh, good lay leaders should not be threatening to you. Mm -hmm. They are a compliment to you. Mm -hmm. I say, if there are good lay leaders emerging in your parish Sorry. communities, that's good. That's a good sign that you are a good leader as an ordained minister. But if you monopolize leadership, then your 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 faithful will remain like a flock. Yes, you know they're like you know a herd of mere followers. Right. You know, you cannot you know enhance uh, the next level, which is mission. That's right. the third uh, big right. challenge to synodality. If you don't allow them to participate actively in the dynamics of the mm -hmm. church. So participation is the key word, you know, that they are part of the church. Mm -hmm. They are not just an audience. They are not just onlookers or uh, right. th that they wouldn't enter the church like they are, you know, just watching, you know, that right. they are participants. They take part in the life of Christ so that they can take part in the mission of Christ. And usually the people who come to church are only about 10 to 15 percent of the total population of mm -hmm. the parish community, uh, the majority are still non-church goers. Right. So if you just wait for people who come to church, then you are not able to reach the majority. For sure. Mm -hmm. So that's why I keep challenging uh, our priests to start establishing mission stations, uh, which is our response to Pope Francis's challenge to go out to the peripheries, peripheries. yeah, yes. uh, and, and to seek them out, you know. That has a lot of challenges with it, you know, because uh, like uh, the tendency, like I said, is to wait, you know, and with just the people who come to church regularly, mm -hmm. the priests are very busy already. Mm -hmm. And believe it or not, our, our priests are burned out. Right. Because there are so few. Mm -hmm. You know, I was even surprised that there are more priests in India mm -hmm. where, you know, Catholicism is a minority. Here, mm -hmm. Catholicism is a, ma a majority, but... Uh, we don't have enough priests. Yeah. I'm just wondering, the participation that you mentioned, the synodality of the church, this is the vision of Pope Francis and even the Second Vatican Council yes. and the Plenary Council of the Philippines yes. in the 90s. I'm wondering, how can lay people help you, our bishop, here in the Diocese of Caloocan and other prelates of the church in, this, in the renewal of the spirit of evangelization in this side of the world? 
Actually, if only we can take synodality very seriously, then uh, we can take communion, participation, and mission mm -hmm. as seriously. That means that we consciously uh, promote ministries, not right. just the ordained ministry, but lay ministries mm -hmm. as well. Uh, we have to be more aggressive in creating new ministries where they are needed. Right. And my feeling is the ministries, the, the traditional ministries in the church are not adequate. Mm -hmm. and, and some of them have become even irrelevant. Okay. And where need, like now, you know, the social communications ministry is right. a big ministry. Right. 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 And it's being contributed by a lot of young people, mm -hmm. digital natives, you yes. know. And I'm very happy when you have young people finding their niche, you yes. know, they're finding yes. their, their, their uh, contribution right. to the church, you know. But that's still not enough. Mm -hmm. In the diocese, we created a new ministry we called Kaagapay. Agapay. And this is uh, what we call psycho-spiritual accompaniment. Mm -hmm. There are people endowed with the basic gift of empathy mm -hmm. and the gift of listening uh, and being able to accompany people, especially those who are going through mental health issues. Mm -hmm. you know? It's the ministry that is very useful, especially for drug rehabilitation, right. addressing anxiety disorders mm -hmm. and depression, grief, uh, mm -hmm. counseling, you know, and all of this. I'm finding a lot of new volunteers in this new kind of ministry. So that's what I'm talking about as uh, energizing uh, evangelization work in the church. We have to be more aggressive in allowing lay people to participate and to discover, first of all, their own lay vocation. Right. The priestly and religious vocations have to complement the lay vocations. Mm -hmm. you know? And it is sad when people talk about vocations, they immediately talk of priesthood, right. you know? Right. They immediately talk of religious life. But what about the vocations of the laity? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what is our, we have a common vocation That's as true. a church to engage in mission. You know, we're not a church for ourselves. We don't invite people to volunteer to the church to serve the church. Right. Even if we have a lot of people serving the church, but that's not yet ministry. Right. For me, my understanding of the ministry is not just serving the church, but serving society mm -hmm. as part of the church. The word synodality can appear as abstract. Mm -hmm. Like I, I could ask an average uh, person attending mass mm -hmm. and he may not know what synodality means. Yeah. But how do we explain this to a young person? So much so that this young person will say, call me in, I want to be, to be part of this mission on synodality. Actually, synodality, it's a uh, uh, basic meaning is really walking together. Walk together. Yeah. So in Tagalog, we translated it as kalakbay. kalakbay. Magkakalakbay, you know. We journey together. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it stirs up the imagination to, you know, even think of life in this world as a pilgrimage. Right. We're on a journey. Right. And we have an ultimate destination. Right. We're just passing through. And now we have to learn to treat every fellow human being as a companion in the journey, mm -hmm. not just your fellow Catholics, mm -hmm. you know. We can walk with every fellow human being. Mm -hmm. uh, we can always find common concerns with fellow human beings who might not necessarily share our faith mm -hmm. or share our doctrine, you know. That's a beautiful goal, mm -hmm. an objective. And uh, it's like to dream not just for ourselves, but for the world, you know. Uh, to be able to make a difference uh, in, in society. Bishop, speaking of making a difference, you have a show that has been making a difference for <laughs> decades already. Could you tell us a little bit about Men of Light? It started, the, the show started uh, as Men in White. Oh, okay. That's, that's, that's interesting. the origin of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and it was a, a deliberate pun for Men in Black. Mm -hmm. you, you remember yes. that movie? There was this Hollywood movie called right. Men in Black, and then it was uh, Marilu Diaz Abaya. And she produced, you know, big films like Jose Rizal, Muro Ami, mm. Pagubuan, you know. Yeah, I'm familiar that's with the, this. That's uh, Marilu Diaz Abaya. Mm -hmm. One time, uh, I was in need of a little help in media apostolate. Right. And since she was directing my brother's show mm -hmm. on, on television. Yes. And it was called Public Forum with Randy David. David yes. Yeah. Empowering poor people to be able to articulate themselves. Right. And it was in Filipino. I talked to Marilu and I asked her if she could just uh, give us one day orientation about media apostolate. Right. You know, social communications. And she said, oh, I can do more than that. Okay. I, I can volunteer to be your director. Wow. She did it, pro bono, you know. Mm -hmm. It was for free. Mm -hmm. And when I was telling her, 
Oh, so what do we do? We don't have equipment. He said, social communication is not about equipment. It's about delivering a message. Right. And, and she said, I think you have the best message to communicate. Mm -hmm. The gospel. He says, I am a storyteller, she said. Yes. There is no story worth telling except a story of salvation, a story mm -hmm. of redemption. And I, I believe in happy endings, she said. Yes. If it is not happy, then it's not yet the end, she right. said. I think your mission is to teach people how to tell their stories mm -hmm. properly. And who else can teach us to tell our stories properly except Jesus, he said. Because the master storyteller. The master storyteller who will teach us about the real goal of humanity, which is to become sons and daughters of God, members of the divine family, you know. And, and that really inspired me. And she did volunteer work for the social communications apostolate. And by then, the social media were beginning to come up. Yes. And she was the first to advise us to go into Facebook, mm. to go into YouTube, you know. Yes. Because she said, it's... It's free. You yes, know? yes. Eventually, we were able to buy our equipment, you know, and eventually we were able to put up, build our own studio, studio. <laughs> and that's it. The rest is history, and we, we haven't stopped producing weekly episodes mm. and daily. We have daylight sharers, so if we have. Uh, the weekend is called Men of Light, mm -hmm. and that's a one-hour talk show on the Sunday Gospel. Mm -hmm. And in the weekdays, every day we have lay people who are you know, doing their own lecture divina and sharing about the, uh, the snippets, about the, the, the readings for the day. Right. So the whole year round, we would have, you know, reflections on the, the, the readings for the day and readings for Sunday. And that's it. For 20 years, we have been doing it. Bishop, hope is what I got from this encounter with you. And we thank you for the time you spent with Shalom World. And I'm sure a lot of our viewers would uh, want to hear a take-home message that you want them to ponder on. So do you have any final words for our viewers tonight? I am a storyteller and in fact I have a, a, a group of friends we put ourselves together and call ourselves a Storyteller Society. And our mission is uh, to teach people how to tell their stories properly so that they will reach uh, the proper happy ending. The element of redemption must always enter into our art of storytelling. And our greatest model for storytelling should be no less than Jesus Christ himself who proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God. So, dear brothers and sisters, please don't give up on humanity. Uh, don't give up on the world. The world is good. You know, God created us. God created the world. And he saw that it was good. And he saw that it was very good precisely because we are there as his co-creators and partners in the ongoing creation and redemption of the world. That's my good news to all of you. Thank you so much, Bishop Ambo. And now we would want to request you for your apostolic blessing, which we are so excited to receive. One of the forms of blessing that I love to impart is really the Aaron blessing, you know. And uh, usually we hear it on New Year's Day, mm -hmm. you know. And that's the blessing that Moses taught the Israelite people, especially the parents, to impart on their children. So I would like to give you this uh, blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let His face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you kindly and give you peace. And may Almighty God bless you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Friends, thank you so much for joining us in Heart Talk tonight with Bishop Ambo David. We look forward to having you once again as we encounter another shepherd of the Catholic Church. God bless everyone.